No, Commander, I was just commenting that the uh, the Stargazer was a starship on Star Trek. Specifically the next generation. Yeah, I'm more of an original series man myself. I was always partial to DS9. Good show. Who cares what I think? Moonjumper here with another round of Who Cares What I Think About Star Trek. Today we're going to be talking about Star Trek Generations. No, 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 not the movie Star Trek Generations. In fact, this is going to be part two of Discovery vs. Picard. Be sure to check out part one, link down below and at the end of this video. No, I mean literally multiple generations of Star Trek fans and how, depending on what age group you're in, what era of Trek you grew up in, how that may or may not inform your likes and dislikes relating to a franchise that's nearly 60 years old. Do you realize The Cage was filmed in 1964? That's 58 years ago. You know, now I'm not that old. I, I was a child watching Star Trek in the 70s and 80s. The original series, the animated series, the animated series actually introduced me to Star Trek on Saturday mornings. The movies, you know, all years before there was a next generation. I am a hardcore old school original series Trekkie. Now notice I said Trekkie. Trekkers are TNG fans who, like Jean-Luc Picard, fancy themselves a bit more evolved than us brash shoot-from-the-hip-cook era Trekkies. And no, I'm kidding, relax, it's a joke. I love my TNG brethren. I'm just riffing on that age-old Kirk fans versus Picard fans, which was a big thing back in the late 80s, early 90s. A lot of y'all don't even remember or may not even been born. That's true. They're still making Star Trek movies and a new series. Yeah, which is even better than the original. I'm sorry, what did you say? You heard me. Star Trek Next Gen is better than original series. But it's true, TOS and TNG fans tend to view Star Trek a bit differently, to interpret it a bit differently. And that's not a criticism. There's no right or wrong. No one is a moron for liking or not liking a TV show or a specific episode of a TV show or interpreting it differently. If you love Threshold, you be you, buddy. It's okay. There are Star Trek episodes and movies I consider needlessly maligned, others I I think are vastly overrated. If you love Discovery, that's fantastic. I do not, and I am happy to give you the reasons why I don't. Even season four, which has vastly improved the series, but I still have some issues with it. But if you and I disagree on that, that doesn't make you or I less of a fan. If you say you're a fan, I take your word for it. You will never hear me say, you are not a real Star Trek fan because you disagree with me. Thank God we can disagree because that is what makes us individuals. Infinite diversity and infinite combinations. So what I want to discuss here is what might be some of the factors that mold our opinions. And I'm talking about myself in this, you know, self-analyzing my own convictions when it comes to Star Trek. And I have strong opinions that I am not shy about sharing and you are free to disagree with me. We can discuss it down below. I just ask please keep it simple and family friendly but when it comes to generations of fans I you know I haven't taken any polls I'm not a trained psychologist but I think I can recognize certain patterns through decades of observations and conversations with fellow fans of every generation I am quite sure that my old-school preference for the original series over the next generation informs my attitudes and interpretations when it comes to Star Trek Discovery versus Star Trek Picard and the same could be said when it comes to my attitudes towards Star Trek The Next Generation versus Deep Space Nine. 
I believe in a broad sense. None of this is absolute. I, I know TOS fans who despise Star Trek Picard and TOS fans who like it. And maybe this is all just projection on my part. But in broad strokes, I do believe there are at least some generational differences in how fans view the various series in the Star Trek franchise. Be it the original series, the animated series, TNG, DS9, Enterprise, or Discovery versus Picard. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's natural. It's to be expected. It, you know, you can see and sense the patterns. People who love Discovery, which is fine. Please enjoy it. And as I said, season four, has gotten better, even though I still don't love it, and I'll give you an idea briefly why I don't. Primarily, I have an issue with the 32nd Century Federation now being too familiar 900 years in the future after they spent the first two seasons going out of their way. They put extra effort into showing us a 23rd Century Federation, a specific and iconic period of history that was completely unrecognizable. Like, now you have the red, gold, and blue uniforms? Really? And the other day, they had an episode, which was a good episode, probably one of the best they've done, but they referenced the Kittimer Accords. Like, I don't know, it was something like, oh, we can't do that because of the Kittimer Accords, which was a treaty specifically between the Federation and the Klingon Empire, and I wouldn't think would be particularly applicable to what was going on anyway. Regardless, 900 years later, the Kittimer Accords are still relevant? Something they would bring up now? I guess it's possible. <laughs> I suppose the Magna Carta still has philosophical value. There are a couple of really old treaties that are still in effect, not 900 years old still in effect, but I don't know, it just seems weird. It seemed like just another name drop they looked up on Memory Alpha, but that's just me. And at least with it being in the future, it's not damaging any previous continuity. It's at least not name dropping the Kittimer Accords decades before it was even drafted pre-TOS. That's the kind of stuff, not that specifically, but the kind of stuff we saw happening in the first two seasons of Discovery. Anachronisms that forget the visuals, do have a major impact on story continuity. Now, if you do love Discovery, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm happy that you enjoy it. Your love for Discovery is every bit as valid as my love for TOS and DS9. I'm just saying these are my feelings as an old school Star Trek TOS guy. Discovery just isn't as likely to be appealing to my generation of fandom. Sure, you might be 55 years old, grew up with Kirk and Spock, and you just love Discovery. That's possible. But if I'm in Vegas putting down big money, it's probably a safer bet to assume that you are considerably younger than either TOS or TNG fans, both of whom tend to be more let's say skeptical of discovery uh, but perhaps for different reasons Double! <laughs> that is Double, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> discovery especially season one was patently offensive to a lot of older TOS fans including myself whereas the little bit younger TNG era fans you know we're not that far apart in age we were teenagers or older in the 80s pre TNG they were teenagers or younger in the 90s during TNG and I do not think that TNG fans were generally cheerleaders for Discovery when it premiered especially when it came to Discovery's darker bleaker tone however my sense has been that TNG fans have tended to be a little more for giving of Discovery's visual discontinuity with TOS. Uh, well, except for maybe the Klingons. I think we all hated the Discovery Klingons. But for TNG fans, it was not so much the visuals, it was primarily the tone of the show they didn't care for. Or maybe they didn't like Michael Burnham, the idea of a central hero instead of a co-equal ensemble cast. Whereas I, having grown up on TOS, tend to fall on the flip side of that. I don't mind the darker tone in the swashbuckle buckling action, the dominance of a central hero. That's all very TOS, but Discovery's complete lack of any visual continuity with the period whatsoever was infuriating. Some would call that unimportant. I call it canon. 
And yes, as an old school TOS guy who still watches it every night on H and I, Saturdays on MeTV, been watching it over and over and over again since the 70s, somehow never get tired of it. I could pretty well recite the dialogue of every episode for you. Now I can't do that with TNG or Voyager, although I can almost do that with DS9 and Enterprise, but especially TOS. Now whether or not that's healthy is another matter, but I can only imagine what some of you young Discovery fans out there uh, must think of uh, uh, of us older guys thinking. Man, you're so obsessed with the look and the cannon and you know and you're, you're just obsessive compulsive you know you're, you're not wrong okay you know, we are we absolutely are but i would just ask younger folks as much as we old fart tos and tng guys need to relax a little keeping in mind that it really is just a tv show and that's true and i don't like gatekeepers either we need to welcome new fans and keep this alive for the next generation but i would just ask the younger folks to try to understand where us older TOS and TNG folks are coming from. We have lived with this canon for decades and decades, and one day, young folks, I promise you it will happen. 10, 20, 30 years from now, some smug group of new writers and producers are going to come along and bulldoze right over the canon of some movie or TV show that you love. It might be Discovery or the MCU or whatever, and fans younger than you are going to laugh at how ridiculous ridiculously outdated the clothes and hairdos of Michael Burnham and her crew are. They are going to laugh at the primitive CGI and just dismiss the Bridge of Discovery as nothing but cardboard sets probably a lot sooner than you think and it is going to piss you off. I promise you it's going to happen to you and then you'll be one of us pleading with the showrunners to respect the canon, begging the writers to at least watch the show before writing a prequel or sequel to it. It's going to happen to you. So with that in mind, try to understand why I'm certainly a lot more likely to be emotionally invested in both the lore and the look of that historical era than someone who was introduced to the franchise via one of the later spinoffs, be it TNG, Voyager, or even Discovery. To me and others who grew up on TOS, that iconic retro aesthetic, those bizarre retro technologies that still managed to propel a starship many times the speed of light is a key part of the history of that universe. Not our universe, but that universe. And it's not just us wild-eyed fanboys. The producers and showrunners of Deep Space Nine, of Enterprise, and yes, even TNG itself all revered and reinforced that canon every time this time period was revisited, with only a couple of footnotes which have pretty well already been reconciled. My Targ won't even recognize me. In the future, it may be possible to reverse the uh, cosmetic effect. Perhaps cranial reconstruction. I have a feeling that's about to become very popular. Visual canon is canon. That is what that era of history looked like in that fantasy universe, which is not our universe. Uh, unless, of course, there really was a devastating world war involving genetic superhumans that I somehow missed in 1996. Ergo, I can almost guarantee that there is no nebulous energy barrier surrounding our Milky Way galaxy that will give you godlike powers if you pass through it. And I can absolutely guarantee you that Vulcans do not exist, Ferengi do not exist, Klingons in any form do not exist, except in the fictional fantasy universe of Star Trek, where they are absolutely real, where they exist in a canonical universe with its own history, continuity, and its own rules, which do not need to follow the rules of our reality because the rules of our reality do not apply. So what if that fantasy future is a retro future? So what if Yeoman Ran has a funny hairdo? In that fictional universe, it's perfectly normal. It's reality. And even if it was somehow our universe, our reality being represented, why assume they would be wearing the hairstyles of 2022? How is that any more realistic than somebody wearing the hairstyles of 1966 in the 23rd century? Why couldn't they wear 
compare the hairstyles of 1966 and the 23rd century. You know, powdered wigs could be back in style for all the hell we know. Why do we have to take away the switches and buttons to replace them with touch screens? You really think they're going to be using modern day touch screens in the 23rd century? I was using a touch screen to order lunch in Epcot Center in 1982 if you want to talk about retro. But the retro technologies we see, the funny hairdos we see in that fictional era of TOS are the technologies and hairstyles already established to exist in that period of fictional future history. They are canon. From my perspective, when Discovery overwrites, effectively decanonizes what we see in the original series, you have to remember that you are also simultaneously decanonizing Trials and Tribulations. You are decanonizing In a Mirror Darkly, both of which acknowledging and embracing the retro look of the TOS era was the whole damn point of the episode, which means you are no longer just treading on visual canon, you are directly impacting story canon. The same even applies to relics. It may even be more impactful in the sense that when Scotty enters the perfectly, authentically recreated bridge of the original series Enterprise, the emotional weight of his reaction seeing this retro yesteryear of which he was a part, unlike the other two examples, there isn't even a hint of tongue-in-cheek here. It is a very moving, very poignant moment, especially when you consider the fact that they didn't have to show this bridge. The showrunners could have easily shown the motion picture bridge. They could have been like Discovery and pretended like this bridge never existed and that the TMP bridge is what it looked like all along, but they didn't do that. They recreated this bridge knowing the emotional impact it would bring to the story. The visual canon, the visual continuity is absolutely a meaningful part of the story continuity, the story canon. You know, I served aboard 11 ships, freighters, cruisers, starships, but this is the only one I think of. And of course, the infamous Discovery Klingons, not only did they turn mammalian humanoids into these reptilian monsters, mutilating Tyler Vok with these horrific surgeries to make him appear human, completely ignores affliction and divergence from Enterprise, that whole two-parter which established a subspecies of Klingons who already look human. Tyler, who already looks like a TOS Klingon, he's perfect, could have been a human-looking sleeper agent aboard the Discovery the entire time without a single surgery. It's not just an artistic choice affecting the visuals. These are enormous plot points which impact the story portion of the canon which Discovery ignores. Therefore, what we see in Discovery is at best anachronistic if one insists that Discovery is a direct prequel set in the same timeline as the original series. Both may be technically canon, but the continuity is dissonant to say the least. But let's say we do ignore the visuals, we ignore Trials and Tribulations, and In a Mirror Darkly. Discovery is just a visual reboot that hasn't otherwise changed the story continuity, has it? Yes, yes it has, dramatically. Not just TOS, but for the entire franchise. I I've already covered a lot of this in previous videos, so I won't get bogged down here. Here's just a few examples up on the screen. Uh, you can hit pause and read them. Suffice to say, the major events, I'm talking about the story, not what shape the struts are on the Enterprise, the major events which take place in the first two seasons of Star Trek Discovery cannot be explained away or shrugged off because young junior officer Spock says, everybody, just don't say anything. We'll all keep quiet about it. It's classified. Harry Mudd, I trust you won't say anything thing about that spore drive, we could trust Harry Mudd not to act on that information. Klingons aren't going to say or do anything with that information. All the millions of people who watch Michael Burnham and her crewmates have medals pinned to their chest on live galactic television. Nah, 
they never existed. And if you ever mention their names, family members, our Gestapo will arrest you and charge you with treason because the Federation is apparently fascist now? I'm sorry, as a TOS aficionado, not to mention Discovery's discontinuity with the rest of the franchise, TNG DS9 Voyager included, that just doesn't work for me. It does not line up at all if Discovery is truly set in the same continuity, the same timeline. It simply cannot be reconciled. The only way to explain it would be some kind of timey-wimey uh, something like the Temporal Cold War, uh, which actually does get mentioned in Season 3 to their credit. Otherwise, it simply cannot be the same timeline. It just can't. Now, Star Trek Picard? By the way, season two dropping any day now? That's not so much of an issue. Love it or hate it, it's set some 20 years after Nemesis, 20 plus years after Voyager. Whatever happens, good writing or terrible writing, it does not change anything that happened before. And for that reason alone, I like it a hundred times better than Discovery, which seemed hell-bent on essentially decanonizing the original series. And for that matter, not paying much heed to any of the spinoffs other than, uh, well, okay, a couple of ham-fisted nods to Enterprise, none of which seem to be the results of them actually watching Enterprise. I mean, you get the impression that if it's not on Memory Alpha, they don't know about it, and if it is on Memory Alpha, they have no clue as to the context or whether or not it's even appropriate to the time period. That's the people running Discovery. Star Trek Picard, on the other hand, which was headed up by Michael Shaven in its first season, actually does a better job in this regard, at least in the first season. You may not like the story he tells, and there's definitely some clumsiness with the logic of the plot, but you get the sense that he has at least watched Star Trek. Narratively speaking, Picard is a continuation of Star Trek The Next Generation, and also Voyager with Seven of Nine being part of the main cast. But tonally, it has more in common with, say, Deep Space Nine. It's certainly not DS9 in terms of quality, which I consider the great pinnacle of the franchise, not TNG. But that's the old school Trekkie in me. I was always lukewarm when it came to the next generation, but Deep Space Nine for me was brilliant and a far truer spiritual successor to the original series than TNG ever was, even though it was set on a stationary space station instead of the Enterprise. Cisco had a lot more in common with Kirk than he ever did with Picard. <laughs> You hit me. Picard never hit me. I'm not Picard. Indeed not. Likewise, Star Trek Picard has more in common with DS9 than it does with TNG, tonally speaking. People tend to think of TNG as the zeitgeist, the defining characterization of what Star Trek is, what the Federation is and represents. And the truth is, it, it's kind of the outlier. It's one series, a moment in time out of the entire franchise, and largely out of character from the Space Western original series, which spawned not only TNG, but the entire Star Trek universe which is pretty tonally diverse. The rough-and-tumble atmosphere of Star Trek Picard feels a lot more like the rough-and-tumble atmospheres of DS9, of the original series, than the oh-so-civilized utopian atmosphere of TNG, which is why I, as a TOS and DS9 fan, probably enjoyed Picard far more than a lot of TNG fans did. TNG fans mostly hated Picard. They disliked Discovery, but they hated Picard. I didn't mind Picard so much, while I despised the first two seasons of Discovery, and a lot of my TOS buddies have said the same thing. But I think that's due to a bit of that proverbial generation gap between older TOS fans and slightly younger TNG fans. But what we do share in common is, we don't want our childhood toys crapped on. Discovery crapped all over the era of the original series, uh, gleefully. No, no doubt in my mind it was on purpose with middle finger extended. And to a degree, Picard does kind of crap all over the mood of the next generation, if viewed through a TNG only lens, but not necessarily, not as egregiously in my opinion, if viewed through the wider lens of the expanded TNG universe, that being the darker tones of Deep Space Nine, 
Voyager and even the TNG movies, First Contact, Insurrection, Nemesis, and everything that could be imagined post-Nemesis, it's all a much darker era than the relative innocence of early TNG, pre-Borg, pre-Dominion War, pre-breakup and ultimately destruction of the Romulan Empire. Read some of the non-canon novels, emphasis on non-canon, but they do speak to the dark, bleak despair of a federation on the brink of collapse, and, and similar beats come up in STO. These stories, albeit non-canon, do inform the bleakness we see in Picard at the dawn of the 25th century, a federation that has been so beaten down it has lost much of its idealism, much of its a little too comfortable naivete. That's not unrealistic. On the other hand, while the mood of Picard may be realistic given everything that's happened, a lot of its plot is completely bonkers, illogical, and the exact opposite of realistic. And I will also concede that while I didn't mind the mood of the series, I did think that the character of Jean-Luc Picard was a little too out of character. You know, as a Kirk era fan, I've always considered Picard something of a pompous ass. I'm sorry, I just do. I mean, to me, he's like the proverbial limousine liberal who deserved being called out on his hypocrisy by Lily in First Contact. In my century, we don't succumb to revenge. We have a more evolved sensibility. Bullshit! by Rafi in Picard, and previously even Q and Guinan to a certain degree back in TNG. Oh no, I know Hamlet. And what he might say with irony, I say with conviction. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. Surely you don't see your species like that, do you? These were much needed wake up calls which did inspire some character growth. Nonetheless, despite any past personal failings of self reflection, like Picard looking down his nose at uh, some alien or someone from Earth's past, uh, we humans in the 24th century have evolved past uh, material wants. Uh, except uh, he's got plenty of material possessions of his own, and you don't see him giving up too many creature comforts. I saw you sitting back in your very fine chateau, big oak beams heirloom furniture. Yeah, I'd show you around my estate, but it's more of a hobble, so that would just be, you know, humiliating. Almost the stereotypical limousine liberal. I, I cheered Rafi calling about on that. Nonetheless, he was always a great captain. You can be a pompous ass, you can be a jerk, but still be a great leader. You know, I, I'm happy to see him become less of an asshole. We did see that kind of character growth happening in TNG's later seasons. I should have done this a long time ago. You are always welcome. He did become much less insufferable, but he was still the great leader he had always been. I, I still wanted to see him be that great leader, whereas in Picard, he is very much a shadow of his former self, lacking that confident gravitas that inspires confidence in others. And that has nothing to do with age. I'm talking strictly demeanor, and that is frustrating. In that regard, I do empathize with my TNG brothers and sisters, where I and other older TOS fans, not to mention DS9 fans, which often often tends to be one and the same, I think, might differ with the more purest wing of TNG fandom, I don't think we're quite as trusting of the Federation as a governmental entity. Ra what Rafi and Rios have in common is their distrust of the Federation. They've both, okay. yeah, they've both been burned. They've both been um, uh, awoken to the fact that it's not all um, you know, <laughs> unicorns and rainbows. Yeah. Um, there's a, they've been disillusioned by what they, they you know, they, they drank the Kool-Aid and the Kool-Aid didn't taste good. I mean, I mean, yes, overall, the Federation is absolutely the good guys compared to others, but I, I have no problem believing in a Federation deep state. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'd be admitting that a man died because- Admit nothing. Say nothing. Let me bury the matter here now thinking of the service. Well, that's the way we do it now. Sweep it under the rug and me along with it. Not only did DS9 brilliantly and boldly peel back the Federation's pristine facade, I, I think I, I think TOS and 
DS9 fans are more likely to remember the original series as it actually was, the TOS era Federation as it actually was, and it was not a utopia, nor did it ever claim to be. It wasn't a dystopia either. The Federation was definitely the good guys in the sense that it was a 1960s stand-in for the United States. It's not an accident that the name of the ship is the USS Enterprise. Sure, United Starship instead of United States ship, but the symbolism is obvious. While the Klingons and Romulans represented our communist authoritarian foes like the Soviet Union, not to mention the very recent living memories of our face-off with Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, the United Federation of Planets represented the United States of America in space. That was the metaphor. But that's not to say that Roddenberry and his creative team, most of whom all fought for our country in World War II, most of them were war veterans, they were patriots, and now they were creating Star Trek, but they were liberals in the classic sense. They recognized that no one was perfect, including us, being represented by the United Federation of Planets, the stand-in for the United States in space. Far from an incorruptible utopia in the Federation of the original series, we saw lingering pangs of bigotry, sexism, corruption, inequality, infighting between member federation states, all this within the federation. That wasn't an accident, it, not, oh, it, just because it was made in the 60s. No, they were deliberately holding a mirror up to the inequalities of the 1960s and setting it in the future so the censors wouldn't notice. Think about the old episode, The Cloud Minders. It seems almost inconceivable to us that the federation would just look the other way while one of their their Federation member worlds forced miners to work under unsafe slave-like conditions while their elite overlords lived in the luxury of their floating cities and not even allow the miners access to those cities because they were seen as animals, as subhuman. Federation members, not the Klingons, not the Romulans, not some random evil aliens of the week. Federation members were doing this. And of course, our hero Captain Kirk put a stop to that but only after the Federation spent how many decades looking the other way because the Federation was benefiting from what was being mined. Hardly utopian, but the progressive messaging was clear. Likewise, those writers at the time believed they were being progressive when on at least two occasions it is strongly implied that women are not allowed to command and that this was an injustice that needed to be changed. But the optimism was that we were starting to see women on the bridge. Even a female first officer? Can you believe it? So in other words, Starfleet is coming around. Now looking back, that seems ridiculous to us. So now we just kind of politely retcon that out. Of course there were female captains. Oh come on, obviously Pike was just trolling number one and Kirk was just placating a woman who was clearly nuts. You know, and those are reasonable retcons that can allow us as fans to look the other way. But that was not what was intended at the time. Hell, we're still not sure what McCoy meant when he said no wonder Vulcan was conquered. Uh, by who? You mean by Earth? You know, kind of a, a little uncomfortable there. And that was even retconned out during the original series and never mentioned again. Even TOS later made it pretty clear that Vulcan was part of the Federation voluntarily. So, you know, uh, you know, I guess Bones was just speaking metaphorically. Nothing to see here. But my point is, this mythical notion of the Federation as this squeaky clean utopia is something that is unique to one and only one Star Trek series, and that's TNG. We didn't see it in DS9. We didn't see it in Voyager where the Federation turned sentient holograms into slaves working Federation minds, despite the precedent already set in Measure of a Man, both of which becomes a thematic prelude to Picard. It's not an accident that Michael Shaman is presenting a post-Borg, post-Dominion, cynical Federation where AIs, be it an android or holograms, have lost ground since Measure of a Man. It's not an ignoring of canon, as many have suggested, it's actually building on it. 
And yes, it is dark. But remember, we live in an era right now where there are those who actually want to reintroduce segregation as a woke virtue, setting civil rights back 60 years. Who's to say that can't happen in the Federation? Just because Jean-Luc Picard wants to drink the Kool-Aid that the Federation, that humanity, had to evolve beyond such reproach? Maybe that's a story that needs to be told. If going backwards can happen to the Federation, it can happen to us. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Just like it's a hard pill to swallow if your view of the Federation is only the version Jean-Luc himself over-idealized in the early days of TNG, only to be disappointed again and again. Through a TNG-only lens, this is shocking, maybe even infuriating, I get that. But to say, that's not Star Trek, that's not the Federation, Actually, it is. A fan of Deep Space Nine or even the original series recognizes it right away. It fits right in. It's true to form. Yes, we're still the good guys. Indeed, a lot better than anyone else out there. But we do have flaws. Because we're not so evolved and above it all as we might think. We're just human, even in the 24th century. In my view, Star Trek Picard actually gets that right. And that's not the only thing Picard gets right. Last season on Picard, we saw canon-accurate representations you would never have seen on Discovery. It took until the late 24th century to see a canon-accurate TOS-era Romulan bird of prey. Canon-accurate TOS-era Romulans without the silly TNG retcon brow ridges that never made any sense. I mean, they were still there, but Picard placed both kinds of Romulans side by side reinserting the TOS Romulans back into canon, which was brilliant. We saw a canon accurate Enterprise D. Unfortunately, current Trek boss Alex Kurtzman did manage to insert his retcon disco prize into Picard, which pissed me off. But overall, Picard has been a hundred times more faithful to the canon than Discovery, which Discovery just outright refused to be while calling itself a direct prequel. But Picard, I'm still on board with. I'm excited about seeing Q and Guinan in season two. I guess we're still going to see Guinan in season two. But I'm even more excited about what season three might bring with the return of the Akudas and Doug Drexler to the Picard design team, which I hope means an even greater dedication to canon accurate visual design in modern Star Trek going forward. But who cares what I think? Still, there's a whole lot about Picard's first season that made absolutely no effing sense. Not to mention, the finale absolutely sucked. It was terrible. They completely dropped the ball, and we will be talking about that in the third installment of Discovery vs. Picard. From deep in the heart of Texas, I am Moonjumper. See y'all next time.